Uh, I think evidence uh, will uh, uh, contribute to uh, policy making, especially when evidence gives uh, voice to children. So having children's voice uh, being heard and communicated to policy makers, I think, is a major uh, contributor uh, that research can bring. I think the place where evidence can make the best contribution to policy development is in focus in in how it will help parents and caregivers um, negotiate the realities of raising children and, and, and helping children develop and grow and thrive in a digital environment. I think the real issue is how does what new stresses and strains and challenges does this pose for teachers and caregivers and parents? Um, and that's where I think we need to, to generate evidence and, and to help those uh, different stakeholders um, do a better job? Everywhere. Um, I think really certainly in South Africa there's a real need and there's a call for, for evidence-based policy making and I think um, policy makers have recognized the need for, for research. I think the challenge is when you've got evidence that perhaps stands contrary or points in different direction to the direction that po policy is actually taking. Um, at the same time, in South Africa, there's a nice space at the moment because of the attention specifically on violence against children. Um, there's a real sort of space to to use research to push the policy agenda um, and to make sure that that um, social media, that ICTs, become central to a whole range of of um, policy items um, across sectors. Research can contribute a lot in terms of trying to um, influence policymakers. Uh, this can only be done if we get all stakeholders, including policymakers, but also researchers, to a common understanding about evidence. And one of the key challenges that I uh, constantly face is getting uh, policymakers to move beyond the moral panics, the scare. Uh, that we face in society about children on the internet uh, and to move beyond uh, the scare and, and have, have their policies uh, be influenced more by the evidence itself and not by the scare. And it's very difficult uh, given the fact that many of these policy makers are coming from a whole different generation than the one uh, children are coming from. So bridging that generational gap uh, in terms of the policy making is something that we need to be working a lot on and, and, and trying to bring policy makers to at least understand uh, uh, the validity of the type of evidence that we're putting on uh, at the table. But I think it's highly time dependent and depends very much on the political uh, agenda and in that sense I think it's very mu much a matter of considered strategy and tactics. Yeah, uh, I so. Uh, in my experience, uh, I think the best uh, uh, method is uh, when you uh, when you uh, plan to do research about uh, uh, children and the internet or children and uh, uh, media use. Uh, you must uh, uh, cooperate with uh, government, uh, with NGOs, with some uh, uh, youth organizations. Uh, you you, uh, you can work together. So uh, I uh, I like to uh, I like to let government staffs like uh, some NGOs uh, to know the uh, real influence of uh, children use ICTs. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, best method. Uh, another method, I, I think maybe uh, sometimes you know, the uh, maybe government staff, uh, maybe a policymaker, they don't think the uh, uh, policy, uh, you know, media policy or uh, policy on children and the ICTs, maybe uh, it's not very important. So uh, sometimes I just uh, put. Uh, you know, put these issues in the um, the children's right framework. You you know CRC, yeah. So you know CRC. 
Yeah, so you know, CRC is very important. It, uh, all, uh, I think that is uh, uh, governmental issues. So just to put uh, this free, a framework uh, in our research. So that is good, very, uh, I, I think that is uh, uh, policy uh, advocacy, yeah. So I'm always very curious about what constitutes the nature of evidence. Um, a lot of popular discourse is that um, policy making requires objective data, quantified streams which are more scientific in the ways in which they operate. But I think if we look at the history of public policy making and especially transformative policy making rather than policy implementation, one of the key things which has emerged is actually an emotional trigger policies come into being and they come into practice when there is a huge public outcry, when there is something which has been generated as such a crisis that it can no longer be accommodated within the existing frameworks of practice, law or regulation. And so I think the biggest challenges for contextual as well as sensitive policy making and implementation is actually to go back to qualitative research. Um, to look at individual stories which can then form collective patterns which might be able to help us understand not a one-size-fit-all blueprint of a policy but a policy that's iterative, a policy that takes into account the views and the responses of the very people that we are trying to safeguard and regulate by using those different instruments of regulation. Well, when it comes to uh, how evidence can influence policy development, we have to ask ourselves first of all what what do we want to change, what change we want to bring about, but also um, what evidence do we want to share? Are we talking about uh, uh, quantitative, qualitative research, what type of questions? We need to understand the policy making processes and to know where are the best entry points for research. Policy making is a political process and it's not uh, it's not very simple, it can be very messy, it's iterative and, um, and therefore uh, researchers need to understand better how the policies are being made and to have these connections and contacts. It's also important to know how to present your evidence to policy makers because they often are very busy people, they don't have time to reach 100, read 150 page reports, uh, so having uh, policy briefs and short reports that are particularly targeted for policy makers could make a difference really. Whether it really makes a difference involving policy makers from the beginning before the research even starts, it's something that we're also discussing here. Um, in some occasions it is uh, very helpful but we also need to know that uh, policy makers change, they're not necessarily constant and by the time our research is finished we may have some other people in the government who will be making decisions. So, um, but uh, advocacy should be part and parcel of our work on research as well. The most effective contributions of uh, the data that we produce for policy makers is to not only raise awareness about the issues related to child online protection and child online activities, but also give uh, reliable and comparable data so that they can design proper policies to address uh, the issues in the country. I think uh, that evidence uh, would help to policy. Um, in our countries, for example, uh, most of the policy is not based on um, scientific evidence. Most of them is on political uh, issues or some uh, particular interests. Some, some of them even based on beliefs and s on myths. Uh, so we need evidence and we have very little ev evidence on this matter in our countries. Chile. <laughs> I think there are two questions going on there. One is uh, what research methodology is the most comparable? So that if, what, what can you apply consistently everywhere for the best results? And then, separately, what is the most effective way of eliciting information from children in different circumstances? And unfortunately, the two answers aren't necessarily the same. So in, term, in practical terms, you probably want uh, to uh, yeah, take a random sample 
it's strictly a random sample of children. Um, there are complexities around doing that in, in any event, but so that's what that's what you'd want to do, um, and ask them a series of standardised questions so you get maximum comparability across markets, um, across age groups, and so on. But actually, in terms of eliciting real richness of information, you probably need a qualitative one-on-one -on -one or peer interview system because getting to children's real experiences is not going to be easily done by a series of pre-formatted questions. Ah, to make sure that uh, pe people understand whether a policy works or not, identifying the deficiencies in it and uh, areas for improvement. That's where evidence-based policy making is key. Uh, that's where the world is moving essentially. So we find that actually providing and undertaking research at an early stage in a country really provides um, a good evidence base for discussions with policymakers, and that really is beneficial um, to have that done before that there's too much work done on the policy development without that solid research. So it enables really the discussions between the industry and the policymakers in terms of what the actual risks and what's going on in terms of children's digital lives. So the, uh, I think the, the main part of the, of the, the evidence uh, that can make the most uh, effective contribution to policy development now, I think, depends so much of the context we are in. But I see things like, for instance, uh, today in terms of policy development, which, has, mm, which is very important, is the uh, aspect of privacy, as we see that uh, uh, the technology is going to bring uh, more and more services uh, and which might become more and more intrusive in our life. I think that there should be there an area where uh, privacy and the research around privacy should, uh, should support policy development. Okay. Evidence is important in every uh, area of, of policy development. If you haven't got the right evidence, you could be going down completely the wrong track. Having said that, I, I should you know, emphasize that we make policy often in a highly political environment, and so you're not always guaranteed to get a good result just because you've got the right data. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, uh, evidence is important. When we talk about child rights uh, promotion, uh, provision and participation and protection, I think in all three areas because uh, uh, policies has to be there f in all three areas. And I think there is very little information when it comes to uh, opportunities in the digital world. And by having a proper evidence for, I would say, solid advocacy, uh, I think we can uh, expand the, the, um, the opportunities and access of children to internet and access to, to quality content and, and etc. Uh, and I think uh, just by realizing that the 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 the, the, um, um, the the coverage that is already there makes a big uh, um, issue for for policymakers or makes makes a big issue for op um, for opportunities of policy for policy action and for program uh, program interventions. Uh, but I also think it's very important for protection. Uh, because uh, this is really the, the, the key area where we um, have to work uh, with the systems and ensure that children are provided opportunities with the proper, with the proper support. Um, I think that evidence-based research is essential to policy making. Um, deciding a course of action or deciding the strategy of the government or the different ministries has to be based on uh, some uh, research. There are different options uh, open in front of uh, the government entities or the ministries, so the research is what is really offering uh, facts, evidence that would uh, uh, clarify the, the suitable options to the decision maker. Uh, so I'm very much for conducting not just uh, a once uh, in a lifetime research on child online, but regular uh, research on this particular subject in Egypt. I think again that it's important that you have an evidenced approach so that you don't make the errors of you know not addressing the crucial issues. Um, and to do that, you need quality research. You need 
better data sets, certainly than what exists in, in large parts of the world today. Um, so there is a crucial part for research to play here. So I'm particularly in the area of interventions. So I'm interested in how we can use some of these really cool technologies to actually make a difference in children's lives. And that's everything from, for example, birth registration to actually giving girls um, uh, mobile phones to actually allow them to do some informal um, reading of textbooks outside of school uh, to opportunities in e-health and also, um, for example, with UNICEF's U report, uh, letting them use uh, mobile phones to report back on surveys which then influence policy, which in a sense gives them a voice even if they can't yet vote. So there's different ways in which we can use that digital technology to help the children and youth to shape their world and actually support their development. Now the challenge for um, research is then how do we evaluate what if this is a sensible use of money, what if these interventions actually work, and what kind of learning can we take away from these interventions. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, this is a failed project or this is a successful project. I would say that there's an awful lot of learning in every project, and if we iterate and if we find a way in actually communicating our learning better, uh, and finding evidence for good practice, evidence for practice which can be improved, then I think we're going to get better outcomes and that ultimately allows us to use these technologies in a much more effective way. Uh, that was an interesting point that we were discussing through the day today. I think the, the biggest success the evidence can possibly have in influencing the policy is when it gives the insights that are required for implementing the program as such and not just to measure um, the, the situation on the ground. And the, the points that we're talking about, which is coupling the qualitative data along with the quantitative this morning, is a very interesting thought to that extent. Yeah, I think evidence is critical for different policy interventions. And I think it's about prioritizing which interventions you should do. So you need to have the evidence of what is most effective. You need to know, should you invest, for example, in life skills education for children, or should you invest in parenting programs? I think that's when um, researchers actually engage with policymakers and translate their research into something that's digestible for policymakers. We have to understand the worlds of the policymaker as well and the pressures they're under if we want our research to be listened to. Um, my background is uh, communication and I see that evidence is very crucial in uh, trying to influence and convince policymakers um, to realise policies that will um, fulfil and realise child rights. Obviously, the key thing is trying to find the trends, the, the gaps in capacity that uh, resonate with uh, the policy makers. And it's a, a really big piece of work trying to translate this evidence and repackage and also trying to communicate to them. I think there are some interesting challenges around making uh, evidence available to and relevant to kind of ongoing policy debates. Uh, one is uh, policymakers have their own agenda and their own kind of timetable for when they're ready to make an intervention and researchers don't always have the evidence ready for that so one's trying to kind of anticipate what are the upcoming policy opportunities to which we can get evidence to speak. And then there are times when as researchers our evidence tells us something that is not on the policy agenda and then there's a kind of challenge of making sure that policymakers hear that there is an important message coming from children or an important message coming from researchers about an emerging trend that they may not have thought about yet that they need to take into account in their work. Evidence um, in relation to digital technologies um, is clearly a lot, a lot of interest in a range of domains. I think one of the areas that came up um, a lot when we were developing um, uh, uh, the research for the Millennium Cohort study was people were very interested in um, sedentary behaviour and whether that was associated with the use of um, uh, digital technology that people were w um, watching more downloads, they were spending more time um, sitting around using um, Facebook rather than communicating um, outside or 
with their, with their friends in more active ways. Um, I think it's possibly an overstated anxiety, but it's one that um, I think we can say a lot more about in relation to how people use these and how they interact with other forms of socialisation. Um, and uh, to give an example, in the Millennium Cohort study at age 14, we're collecting a time use diary uh, where children actually say how they're spending their time. So as well as trying to capture information on the amount of time they spend, um, uh, watching clips or um, communicating by Facebook and, and other um, social media, we also try and capture um, what, the, what they're actually doing, whether they're doing that while they're out and about, for example. Um, I think other areas, of, there's a lot of concern, um, obviously, around um, safety and, um, and digital technology use. Um, but I think we, we also need to see this in the context of wider issues around safety about children um, in the home and outside the home, and um, uh, with concerns, concerns about children's safety to play, children's safety, safety on, the, on the streets as well. But I think sometimes use of um, technology is seen as a, as, a, as a safe option by parents. Um, and it's, again, that's an issue I think we can, need to understand a lot more about. Um, uh, and, and obviously, the EU keeps in mind a lot around how, how much parents um, set, set boundaries and so on. Um, but uh, we can also uh, get develop understanding of how that relates to how parents intervene in or manage or develop their children's lives more generally. And then I think the third area is that there's a lot of um, uh, is a lot of interest in how. Um, use of di digital technology influences children's educational and cognitive outcomes um, and that their um, inequalities in, in access to, for example, the internet um, are still seen as very important because there's increasing dependence on being able to access the internet for homework um, and for, um, uh, for, uh, yes, for, for, for school work more generally and expectations that this is the norm. Um, and so we think it would be um, very important to see how um, inequalities are fostered perhaps by this increased use of digital technologies in um, educational and cognitive development. Well, I think research has plays a huge role in, in uh, informing policy decisions um, and, and I think um, in, in terms, of, um, in terms of, the, of the type of research that is needed, it, it really needs to be very focused and I think that's Sometimes we see, even at UNICEF, you know, we do very broad, uh, broad things and, and not very specific. Because I think if you want the research and evidence or the compilation of evidence be uh, effective, it needs to answer specific questions related to the desired outcomes. And, and therefore, uh, it, I think it needs to be structured differently. So if, if, you, if the aim is really uh, you know, to achieve policy change, the, the kind of general scope of research uh, um, is, is not enough. Uh, also, already in the f kind of formation of the research questions, you need to facilitate the, the decision makers because I think uh, in order to have um, the kind of the right uh, recommend right format for recommendations, uh, it, it really depends on the audience that you're you're targeting. Well, I think this this area, as I said, of um getting children's world views. It certainly brings issues to life. It shows policymakers that they may have to reformulate the way they do things if they want to engage with children. And we've had this discussion later on, haven't we? Uh, you know, you want, to, you want children to comment on whatever policy is taking place, or comment on research, or comment on how to design solutions for the future. Well, you, you never have to hear from them in the first place, and policymakers are, are, are one audience. Well, I think uh, the policy makers usually want numbers. But when we join numbers with uh, voices, this, the story makes it big, is much more strong. So I think it's important to combine uh, statistics and uh, strong uh, based statistics uh, than uh, with very rigorous methods with uh, also the voices of the children explaining processes, uh, telling about their feelings, about their fears, about their pleasure of being online. So when we join these both sides, the numbers with stories and narratives uh, from children and from other people that uh, works with children, the story becomes stronger and uh, touch more the different stakeholders, not only the politicians, but also the parents, but also the, let's say, the public opinion. So uh, I, I support the idea that we should combine qualitative and quantitative research. 
I think, again, if we can communicate tangible examples, so case studies, um, give, give statistics that are meaningful, and um, find stories within the data um, that, that the general public can understand and meets needs that, that policymakers have, and also we can hopefully drive agendas by showing where the needs are, that that's where evidence can make the most impact. Uh. Probably in putting uh, the online risks into perspective, uh, both uh, with regards to you know other online risks, so that you can compare between individual risks and also uh, in comparing between online and uh, and offline.